And now what I would like to do is read from the new Casey Jones, because this was so sad. I decided not to read the scene where she goes to a crack house. I think, <laughs> I think we'll all skip that one. Instead, we're going to go to a gospel church tonight. Um, those of you who have read my books know that I actually write about race fairly often, black and white. I write about the New South, and uh, you can't do that without writing about black and white. And so I just kind of, kind of come right out and say it. So if I offended anybody, uh, that's just too bad. Uh, <laughs> uh, also, I should let you know that uh, little Debbie Cakes figure prominently in this book. <laughs> in fact, I think of an, inventing, uh, it's like a drinking game. Every time you run across a mention of a little Debbie Cake, you have to eat one while you're eating it. <laughs> but if you buy one of these tonight, you get your choice of little Debbie Cakes out here. Those are not just for decoration. <laughs> has everybody here read a Casey Jones book? Uh, who has not? Just so I can give you a little an intro. Okay. She's a, she's a female private investigator. She's unlicensed. She comes from a white trash background. She's from the Panhandle of Florida. And I picked that background for her because that's sort of the last remaining group in America that it seems okay to bash, <laughs> or, you know, or, or, poor, or poor white people. And so, um, you know, traditionally the private eye walks alone outside the boundaries of society and operates and gets justice for people that aren't within the system. So that's why I chose her. Uh, her name is Casey Jones, and in this particular book, she's trying to track down a missing. 14-year-old uh, boy, and the grandmother has asked her to find him, and she quickly figures out the grandmother's actually dying and she needs to hurry. And as part of it, she learns that she needs to find, um, quote, a black man in a bread truck. And that's about the only clue she has. And this is taking place in Durham. And so this is her a chance, and she, at this point in the story, has narrowed it down. It might be a percussionist a drummer because there's drums on the side and uh, there's a chance that they play at churches so she's been driving around looking for the right church. I almost missed the truck and the crush of vehicles jamming the parking lot of the Holy Redeemer Church of Christ out on Rosa Sharon Road. If I, my southern accent's going to come back as I read this. <laughs> if I had not stopped my car to investigate a mysterious knocking I would surely have missed it. Pulling to a halt near the side of the lot, I determined two things. One, the knocking was not my transmission, but an immense and persistent rhythm coming from inside the church. And two, the bread truck was right there, parked behind a 16-passenger van that was currently disgorging a bevy of plump ladies dressed to the nines, the feathers on their hats bobbing like quail as they scurried inside the massive church doors. All of them were black. And no doubt, so was every other face in the place. Me, I am not just white, I am white. As in white trash, white with genetically pale skin that screams, all I do is watch television, eat hostess snowballs, and live in a trailer park. <laughs> and I was suddenly conscious of my two blonde hair and intentionally black roots, which I wear simply to confuse people into underestimating me. <laughs> okay, I was white, they were not. This clearly presented a problem when it came to blending in. There was nothing I could do about it except move fast. The pulsating beat grew louder as I approached the front stairs. The brick stoop was capable of holding 50 people at least and entirely appropriate to the huge structure looming behind it. This was a church built for capacity and judging from the sound that leaked outside, it was filled to the rafters. The doors were massive slabs of wood but not even they could contain the music that poured out into the world, gospel music. Not your grandmother's gospel music either. Not even your mother's gospel music. This was your funky older brother's gospel music confused with a heavy dose of sly and the family stone. <laughs> Whoever was performing in there was burning down the house. I could feel the bass beat clear in the marrow of my bones and I wasn't even inside yet, Lord. But if anyone in there had a pacemaker, it had to be thumping in their chest like Jack Rabbit Slim. <laughs> As I reached the top step, two doormen dressed in matching gray suits flung the front doors open for me like I was the Queen of England. A tidal wave of sound rushed over me. I felt as if I had been literally lifted off my feet and rushed upward to heaven. It was the most amazing sound I have ever heard. A Niagara Falls of voices, raised in chorus, fueled by passion just this side of hysteria, soaring over the music of a band that must have numbered over a dozen people to be making such a ruckus. The hair on my arms rose as adrenaline shot through my body. This was why people fell to the ground and spoke in tongues. While normally sane individuals fainted in ecstasy, praising a higher power, music like this was impossible to hear and remain unmoved. 
It was faith in its most robust incarnation, hope made real in sound. Alto voices, baritones, tenor, sopranos soaring above them all, guitars, drums, bells, at least two sets of keyboards, and a driving backbeat that threatened to blow out the stained glass windows above me. The crushing side was so great I could not see the front of the church. I began to wiggle my way through the crowd, slipping from space to space. People stepped aside or looked past me. No one seemed to notice I was white. They were too polite or hypnotized by the show in front of them. Some swayed along, a very few sang along, and most everyone seemed content to watch. This was not a service, I realized, but a performance, and someone was giving it their all. I wrote this before the inauguration, by the way, just for the record. <laughs> Suddenly, a contralto voice filled the air above the crowd with a note that hovered, swelled, and broke, then ran up and down the scales in a spectacular display of vocal fireworks. The crowd erupted in applause, and I realized that whoever the singer was, she was just getting started. She was Whitney Houston on steroids, with a hefty dose of Ethel Merman thrown in. <laughs> she, was my uh, she was my chance to reach the front as every eye was on center stage. I weaseled through packs of families and bypass groups of sweet-smelling men with gleaming shaved heads that shone like mahogany in the crimson stained light pouring in through the stained glass windows. I finally reached a cross aisle and made my way to a side area where I'd be able to get closer to the stage. As I drew closer, I spotted the source of the driving backbeat that was rattling the fillings in my teeth. I stopped short, astonished. This was not something you see every day. Middle-aged triplets. <laughs> aligned in a row. Each one dressed in a different colored pencil leg zoot suit, purple, gray, and black. Each held a Fender Bass 350, and their fingers were flying as they dipped forward and leaned backward in perfect unison, emitting a beat that rattled my breastbone like a train driving through the church. All three of them were identical, tall and slender with coffee-colored skin, delicate features, gleaming gold teeth winking at the crowd, eyes closed as they concentrated on the music. A crowd of young women clustered at their feet, gazed upward at them with a rapture not even their mothers could muster for the Lord himself. <laughs> Behind them, a huge stained glass window displayed three angels reaching out to St. Peter. But honey, those angels didn't have a prayer of being noticed, not with that competition nearby. My God, most unholy fantasies unreeled in my mind as I stared at the trifecta of perfect perfection above me. Now they were proof there was a God. <laughs> Unfortunately, when I noticed what was dominating center stage beside them, my triplet fantasy burst like a balloon in a briar patch, evaporating at the sight of what looked to be a massive little bow peep. Step back, Aretha. A woman stood at center stage several feet in front of a backup chorus of women in glittery gowns who swayed back and forth as they held down the harmony. There must have been six, six of them on backup, but they were small fry indeed compared to the lead singer. She was at least as big as my boss, Bobby D, and that was saying a lot. It meant she tipped the scales at well over 300 pounds. But while Bobby tended to favor leisure suits and gold medallions, this woman was wearing an enormous white dress with rows of raffles cascading down the front and flowing out behind her in a milky river of taffeta. Her hair, if indeed it was hers, had been molded into an elaborate waterfall of bouncy brown curls topped by a floppy white hat exploding with ivory flowers and pink bows. Even more inexplicably, while she held a microphone in one hand, she held a beribboned staff in the other. The tool of a shepherdess calling to her flock a giant toothpick to ensure a head start at the post-performance buffet. <laughs> she was Mega Bo Peep meets Mothra. <laughs> I could not decide, nor could I take my eyes from her. She was magnificent. She sailed across the stage like a queen, or maybe the Queen Mary, bowing and sweeping her staff toward the crowd as she sang, raising it high when her voice climbed into its upper register, lowering it when she took deep breaths. She was a one-woman symphony orchestra, conductor and all, and she had one of a handful of voices on the entire planet that could have outbelted the massive band arrayed behind her, which reminded me I was on the job. My drummer was there somewhere. I searched the lineup, peering behind the backup singers, but found no African drummers at all. This was a thoroughly modern, electronic, totally juiced-up version of the word. It was the gospel according to Marshall and Fender. <laughs>